Welcome back to part three in this three-part video series on radiation. So I want to look in this final part of our video series uh, at the third of our words in the um, in the title. I want to look at the word beneficial. I want to see whether there are actually forms and uses of radiation that we can consider to be genuinely beneficial uh, for our lives on this planet in one way or another. So you remember uh, in the first video we looked at our basic um, terms so we tried to uh, discover the language uh, that we would need in order to understand what was going on. Uh, the principal types of radiation for instance, how we measure the dose of radiation. Uh, and in the second video, the middle one of the series, we looked at uh, forms of radiation that we might, uh, at first sight at least, consider to be bad. Uh, and um, I began, I hope, to pose a few questions, certainly in terms of balancing risks, that would make us look at this whole topic um, in a slightly more uh, objective and, um, and distanced way. And in this one, as I've just said, I want to, uh, I want to explore whether radiation can be a good thing. So we talked about um, radiation coming at us in an unavoidable sense from the ground beneath our feet uh, in the previous, um, previous video. Actually, it turns out that having this radioactive material as part of the Earth's makeup is extraordinarily beneficial. Uh, in fact, can be considered to be vital for the um, uh, development, the evolution, the sustenance of life on the surface of the planet. Uh, and it's to do with the fact that we have this molten magma that moves tectonic plates around on the surface of the Earth. So these plates that form the solid surface of the Earth, uh, you'll have come across um, before, I'm sure, uh, where they butt up against each other. We have the land crumpling up to form mountains and so on, where one dips underneath another in something called a subduction zone, we can get uh, earthquakes, volcanoes and so on. Uh, and both of those actually lead to a replenishment, a renewal, if you will, of the surface of the earth. Uh, we get fresh material deposited on the surface of the earth, which then gets eroded, washed down as, as soil into the plains below, for instance, um, into which we can plant our crops and so on and so forth. So this, this whole process actually is quite important for life and wouldn't take place if we didn't have molten, this molten magma and the convection currents within it that move our tectonic plates about. Um, now a lot of the heat energy in, in the deep earth is there from the time that the planet was formed. It was formed in a particularly violent way with, with a lot of objects colliding um, and colliding with such energy that, that everything got melted basically. So we had this molten start uh, to our life as a planet. But even now, um, four and a half billion years later, uh, we have about half that heat energy is still left uh, within the deep earth. Now some of it is radiating out into space um, but actually we've got a whole stack of it left. If we've still got half left after four and a half billion years uh, you won't be surprised to hear that it's going to be um, at that sort of level for a long time yet. Um, but that's only half. The other half of the heat energy that keeps the magma molten, keeps our tectonic plate activity going, in other words, is coming from the decay, the radioactive decay, of particular isotopes of elements within the Earth. So things like uranium. You remember we looked at the uranium decay chain twice now uh, in this video series. Um, 
radioactive decay events like that in the Earth are depositing energy into the Earth that is helping to keep this magma uh, molten, keep it going. So actually having radioactive materials as part of our makeup turns out to be extremely important. It's not explaining the temperatures at the surface of the planet, by the way. At the very, very surface, the majority of our um, heat energy is coming from the sun. But in terms of lower down, so, you know, deeper into the crust uh, and towards the magma and the core of the Earth, that heat energy is, is now not coming from the sun. It's coming, as I say, from the leftover heat from the formation of, of the Earth and from the fact that there are radioactive isotopes in that mix that are continuing to heat the thing up. Um, and that's therefore really important for the Earth keeping the shape that it does uh, in the sense of uh, a livable environment. Uh, for um, uh, for all the creatures, in fact, that live on the surface. The fact that we have this molten material uh, way down beneath our feet is key to the generation of the magnetic field that we have as a planet. Not every planet has a magnetic field. Venus doesn't, for instance. Mars doesn't. Um, and these, I suggest, are other factors one has to um, put into the equation when we're thinking about whether we want to move to somewhere like Mars, for instance, because the magnetic field that we get from um, the rotation between the inner and the outer core of the Earth is protecting us from, uh, essentially, from radiation damage coming from the solar wind, these really fast, energetic particles that are coming from the sun, um, most of which have a charge associated with them. So, you know, think in terms of the beta and the alpha radiation particles that we talked about uh, way back in, in the, first, uh, the first video those get diverted, they get deflected by this magnetic field. So the Earth is actually protected from most of the stuff that's coming out of the sun that would otherwise be extraordinarily harmful uh, for life on the surface of the planet. Uh, and in fact the only places we see a hint of this stuff and again it's been, you know, it gets um, uh, Shield, we get shielded a little bit from it just by the atmosphere, but at the poles, so where the magnetic field dips into the north and south pole of the Earth, uh, some of these particles can leak in. Uh, and in fact, it's those that give us the um, aurora, uh, the northern lights, the southern lights. Uh, but on the whole, the Earth's surface is protected from the solar wind because of the magnetic field and the magnetic field only exists because we have this molten material um, in the core of the Earth and we only have that because there's all this heating uh, effect taking place um, from radioactive decays uh, within, uh, within the material that makes the planet up. Now, helium is sort of fun in terms of, you know, party balloons and so on, but actually has a wide range of benefits uh, beyond that. So for instance modern airships not filled with hydrogen but filled with helium, non-flammable, um, we require huge amounts of the gas for that. Uh, the scans, 3D scans that we get uh, medically in hospitals rely upon um, magnets that are cooled down to the temperature of liquefied helium. Really, really cold. So we're, you know, we're going almost 270 degrees centigrade below the point of, of freezing. Um, and those are the temperatures we get to once we've liquefied uh, the gas into um, the liquid helium that cools the magnets. Uh, in these rings. So we wouldn't get this diagnostic medical imaging without helium. 
Um, and that brings us on for, uh, what is this, the third or the fourth time we've looked at this uranium um, decay chain. But it's telling us something important, and this isn't the only place uh, that we can see this happening. But the key thing here is that all of these decay events that I've shown in my blue arrows on the screen are associated with alpha decay. That's the form of radiation involved. Um, here's our radium decaying into radon, for instance, down here that we looked at in video two in the context of building regulations over granite and so on. Each of those, as I say, is releasing an alpha particle. Now remember what an alpha particle was from video one. It's two protons and two neutrons. The helium atom is two protons and two neutrons in its nucleus and then with a couple of electrons uh, around, uh, around the outside. So all bar adding a couple of electrons, which it can pick up quite easily from the environment, um, each of these alpha decay events is generating helium. So in fact, it's really quite useful that we've got radioactive events going on on the Earth because they're producing for us the very element that we need to run our medical imaging equipment um, and so on and so forth. So I would contend that this is another example of how radiation is actually quite beneficial. And we can pull this apart just a little bit more. Um, we can look, for instance, at using um, radioactive materials as um, pharmaceutical chemicals or tracing chemicals. So for instance, we can inject a, radio, a radioactive material into the blood, very small doses, very carefully selected, because we know, for instance, that this particular element, uh, <coughs> excuse me, will be taken up by a particular part of the body, for instance. So it might be uh, that a tumour is very much more likely to show up um, if we inject one particular element into the bloodstream. And I can take iodine as an example. We can inject a radioactive form of iodine into the blood. Iodine is taken up by the thyroid gland. So in fact, we've ended up with a source of light. It's radiation, but we can think of it as a source of light in this context inside the gland of the body that we need to produce a diagnostic image of. Extraordinarily useful uh, in that sense. And of course then we come to radiotherapy. Uh, you know we all um, know somebody even if you know it's not affected us uh, as an individual who's had radioactive uh, material um, either passed through them from an external source or even had uh, things like radioactive uh, metal rods or beads implanted temporarily into their bodies in order to produce a localised high dose of radiation in order to kill off um, cells in a tumour, for instance. So again, uh, this is an area I think we can safely describe radiation, radioactivity, as um, something that can be turned into a tool that is beneficial for us. Now we come on to this important topic of dating. Um, of course I'm talking about not the subject of this cartoon, uh, but um, radioactive dating. So carbon-14 dating. I, I highlighted this a little bit in the, um, in the previous video when we were looking at elements in our body that contain radioactive isotopes. And carbon-14 is one of those. And it's been turned into an incredibly useful, a very revealing tool for looking at uh, archaeological artifacts, uh, certainly if they've had a biological origin. So, 
you know, living things, as it were, including trees and, and you know, stuff like that. So the examples I've given on the screen, bone, cloth, wood, uh, plant fibres in fact of any sort, so things like flax for instance or linen uh, are all susceptible to carbon dating techniques. And we can go back fairly accurately at least 50,000 years uh, and less accurately further beyond that. So how does it work? Well it's actually a result of the cosmic radiation that's coming in from space above us. Uh, this can um, collide with atoms in the upper atmosphere and kick out from their nucleus um, one of the components of the nucleus, in particular a neutron. And that neutron can then be taken up by nitrogen in the atmosphere. And you know, the atmosphere is, is more than 70% nitrogen, there's a, a lot of it about. In so doing, in capturing this neutron, uh, it turns itself via radioactive decay into carbon-14. In fact this is a beta decay going on here so we get a proton kicked out and what we're left with um, is now a form of carbon, an isotope of carbon, carbon-14. It's just carbon. It's a particular isotope of carbon, but chemically it's carbon. So a growing plant, for instance, or an animal uh, will take this up into itself as it grows, as it builds more material into itself. So in fact, our tree, our horse here, uh, will have absorbed carbon-14 um, all the way through its life. When the tree dies, however, um, no more carbon-14 is being taken up, no more carbon of any sort is being taken up uh, into the material itself. So in a sense it's sort of frozen at that point. Whatever carbon it had and whatever mix of carbon isotopes it had at the point it died uh, is our new starting point uh, for what happens thereafter. So, you know, let's imagine our tree being turned into, I don't know, fence posts or something um, in an Iron Age um, fortified village. That wood started off its life, as I say, with a particular mix of carbon isotopes, which would have included carbon-14. All the other forms of carbon either decay away very quickly or are stable, like carbon-12. Um, so the one that's going to decay steadily over a period of time is this carbon-14 and in fact it decays uh, back into nitrogen-14, believe it or not. So it becomes a gas, it disappears uh, back into the atmosphere. And this gives us our way of dating things because we can use the half-life essentially of our carbon-14 which turns out to be 5,730 years. So when our fence post first went into the ground uh, in the year that it was um, cut out of, of a tree, we've got a complete com uh, complement of carbon-14 isotopes in there, right? Whatever the wood took up during its, uh, its lifetime as a tree. So we're going to call that 100%. Now you know that if we wait one half-life, so in other words we wait 5,730 years, half of those carbon-14 um, atoms will have decayed. That's what the half-life means, remember. Uh, we, we covered this all the way back in video one. So after this period, 5,730 years, we would only have half as many carbon-14 um, atoms left in our fence post. Okay, so if we can measure how much is being given off as a proportion of the total carbon content, we already have a way 
of telling how old our piece of wood is. And of course another half-life later, another 5,730 years, half of this 50% will have decayed, so we'll only have 25% left. And we go on and on, so we're up now to, uh, what is this, this is three half-lives down here, 17,190 years later, we've only got an eighth of the original carbon-14 left. So if we can measure very precisely the amount of radiation being given off by this wood as a proportion of its total carbon content, we have straight away a measure for how long ago it was the plant from which it came died. Right? It doesn't tell us how long this thing has been a fence post. It tells us how long ago it was the tree was felled or died uh, in the first place. Right? So we make an assumption that the timber would have been used within a year or two um, of the death of the tree. Not unreasonable. So that gives us a pretty good handle, doesn't it, on how old this organic material is. And as I say, it can apply to bone, um, to cloth, all sorts of stuff. Um, so in, in the context of archaeology, in the context of going back through um, our origins uh, as peoples, as a species, uh, it's telling us, revealing for us, an immense amount um, about where we came from. And I think it's not unreasonable, once again, to refer to this as a positive, a beneficial use of radiation. But let's take this to a particularly domestic level. So this is the humble smoke detector that I imagine we've pretty much all of us got um, at least one of, probably several of, fixed to the ceilings in our in our houses. The smoke detector works because it has within it a chamber containing a piece of radioactive material. Uh, it's in fact um, an isotope of a um, artificially made element called americium and it's the isotope americium 241. And I've already produced some material on, on how these things work uh, in my very first physics video series of, of this lockdown um, year of 2020. Uh, and if you go and have a look at that at the address uh, that you can see on the screen there, you'll get a bit more of an insight uh, into th how these things work. My intention in this video is only to demonstrate to you uh, that there is indeed radioactive material in there. So I'm going to turn my Geiger counter back on again uh, and once more switch camera views and then we'll have a look. Right, so here we are. Here's an old smoke detector uh, from my house. Um, it's, um, it's completely defunct now so I've taken its outer cover off you can see the circuit board and so on in there um, fairly readily, I hope. Um, let's just try, shall we, and get a little bit closer. So here we are, and this is the main detector chamber. Um, and basically we need in the, um, the air that's inside a gap between two electrical plates. We need to make sure that air is rendered conducting. And we do that using this americium 241. Um, and we get a current because it's conducting. And all the while that current is running, uh, there is no alarm. When we get smoke particles in there, it mucks up the way this is working. And suddenly the current drops, the alarm goes off. But let me just stick the Geiger counter into this chamber and show you what happens. So you'll be able to hear, and if I move this up, you'll be able to see, I hope, 
but the count rate has now gone up considerably. This is about now five counts per second coming from the, um, the americium source in here. Now this is not something I recommend you doing at home. There's no point in doing this uh, unless you're conducting an experiment of this sort in a limited way. Um, the source in there is fairly small, fairly weak, but why expose yourself to radiation if you don't have to? So that's enough, I think, to demonstrate. If I close the cover now and put my Geiger tube back onto the top of it again, you'll notice the count rate is dropping back towards the background level. So it's only taking that little bit of plastic uh, on there to um, remove from us even the residual risk associated with the americium inside. So there we are, our humble, um, humble smoke detector. Something that saves countless lives and that we really wouldn't be without works because it contains a tiny amount of artificially made radioactive isotope. Again, I suggest another very positive outcome of having radiation uh, in the world. Well, I'm not sure whether this is um, genuinely a beneficial use of radioactive materials and uh, radiation in general. But just to finish off, I thought I'd show you a, a fun uh, use for um, uranium, in fact. So I'm going to turn on my Geiger counter again. It'll start picking up uh, background. But I wanted to show you this um, liqueur glass. Uh, this was made in Bohemia. It's um, a little over a century old. Uh, and you'll notice that the stem and the base are green in colour. Now to produce coloured glass, a very common uh, method is actually to dope them with various metals. So we can make a blue glass by adding chromium uh, to the glass mix. We can make greens actually with copper, with iron. Uh, you know, there are various ways of putting colour in. But in this particular glass, uh, it's been coloured using uranium. Quite small quantities, but that's enough to produce this green coloration uh, to the glass here. Um, this is freely available to buy uh, in antique glass shops, for instance, which is where I went to buy this one. Uh, it's not considered a hazardous material. Uh, it's no more dangerous than the old style uh, luminous watches uh, that one used to be able to buy, which um, actually included radioactive material in the paint. Uh, on the um, on the dial face, which is how you could see the numbers and so on. Uh, so this has got uranium in, uh, and it's what gives it its green colour. Now, uranium, you'll remember, decays by uh, an alpha decay process. So our Geiger counter, as I, you know, had tried to say uh, in um, earlier videos in this series, is not going to be terribly good at. at picking it up simply because you'll recall we have uh, a front to our detector which is enough probably to stop all alpha particles getting through. You remember in that first video uh, I made the point that the layer of dead skin cells on the outside of our bodies was enough to prevent uh, alpha radiation being a hazard. It's only when we got alpha emitters inside our bodies, so for instance on the live cells that um, line the inside of our lungs, that it becomes a problem. And that of course is why radon as a radioactive gas that comes out of the ground uh, in areas of granite uh, is such an issue. We breathe it in, we take it directly into areas where there are live um, cells in our body that can be damaged uh, by the radioactive decays. So if I put this Geiger counter up against my glass 
Uh, let's just see what happens. Now you'll note that the count rate goes up quite appreciably. I mean, it's probably gone up. I mean, it's indicating about six counts a second there. So it's gone up at least, I would say, a factor of four or five above the background that we were measuring before. Um, and that's, as I say, it's a bit of a surprise given that I've told you that what's inside here uh, is uranium. I'm just going to turn this off so we don't get the annoying clatter anymore. Um, but think back to the decay chain diagram that we've now seen several times as an example of its kind in the videos. Um, there are some decays in that chain that are beta decays rather than alpha decays. And beta particles most certainly would get through the front of the Geiger counter and be detected. So whilst we might not be picking up clicks from the uranium itself, we can very easily pick up the radioactive decay events that are associated with some of the daughter isotopes that have been produced um, as this uranium is decayed um, from when it was uh, when the atoms were first created back at the beginning of uh, uh, incorporated into the earth I should say back at the beginning of the solar system. So as I say we're picking up daughter isotopes um, of our um, of our uranium atoms, uh, but uh, it's the uranium itself, in all its glory, uh, giving this green tinge to the glass. So beneficial or just pretty, I'll leave that to you to judge. But it's an attractive way, I think, to finish um, our um, series of, of videos on on radiation. And that's it. I finished. Um, so thank you very much. If you've got to the end of video three, you've done very well and I'm proud of you. And hopefully I'll see you for another one of the videos in this, uh, this physics series. Bye for now.